Well, first, I want to say uh, thank you to all of you for uh, being here today. And I want to send a message of gratitude and thanks to the solidarity that we have received from every corner of our country, from our colleagues to our neighbors. We are grateful for your solidarity, your encouragement, and your support in the face of the most recent xenophobic, bigoted remarks from the occupant of our White House. I will always refer to him as the occupant, as he is only occupying space. He does not embody the grace, the empathy, the compassion, the integrity that that office requires and that the American people deserve. That being said, I encourage the American people and all of us in this room and beyond to not take the bait. This is a disruptive distraction from the issues of care, concern, and consequence to the American people that we were sent here with a decisive mandate from our constituents to work on. Everything from reducing the cost of prescription drugs to addressing our affordable housing crisis, to ensuring that the American people have more than health insurance, but health care. More recently, thanks to the partnership of Chairman Elijah Cummings and the advocacy of myself and a coalition of advocates I've worked with for decades, we held the first hearing on childhood trauma. And in sitting in that hearing, as we heard about the many manifestations and iterations of childhood trauma in the wake of the public health crisis and epidemic that is gun violence, in the wake of PTSD, in the wake of those battling substance abuse disorder and a host of other things, it was impossible not to think of the trauma that is being inflicted upon children every day at our border. At the end of the day, if we improve the conditions of children in a cage, they are still in a cage. And we are viscerally, vigorously, and fundamentally opposed to the criminalizing, the vilifying, the mass detention and deportation of migrant families who are simply doing what is their legal human right, and that is to seek asylum. In the tradition of who we say we are as a country, a beacon of light and hope and of refuge. This is simply a disruption and a distraction from the callous, chaotic, and corrupt culture of this administration all the way down. We want to get back to the business of the American people and why we were sent here, reducing the cost of prescription drugs addressing the public health crisis and epidemic that is gun violence, addressing the racial wealth gap, and yes, making sure that families stay together. I also would like to just underscore the fact that despite the occupant of the White House attempts to marginalize us and to silence us, please know that we are more than four people. We ran on a mandate to advocate for and to represent those ignored, left out, and left behind. Our squad is big. Our squad includes any person committed to building a more equitable and just world. And that is the work that we want to get back to. And given the size of this squad and this great nation, we cannot, we will not be silenced. And now I'll invite Representative Omar to offer a few words as well. Thank you, Congresswoman um, Ayanna Presley. This country was founded on the radical idea that we are created equal and endowed by our creator with in, inalienable rights. And yes, we have a long way before we fully live up to those values. It is for this reason precisely that we have to take action when a president is openly violating the oath he took to the Constitution of the United States and the core values we aspire to. As Martin Luther King said, 
All we say to America is, be true to what you say on paper. I believe this is a pivotal moment in our country. The eyes of history is watching us. Right now, the president is carrying out mass deportation raids across this country in each one of our districts. Right now, the president is committing human rights abuses at the border, keeping children in cages and having human beings drinking out of toilets. This president, who has been credibly accused of committing multiple crimes, including colluding with foreign government to interfere with our election. This is a president who has overseen the most corrupt administration in our history and pursued an agenda to allow millions of Americans to die from a lack of health care while he transfers millions of dollars in tax cuts to corporations. This is a president who has said, grab women by the pussy. This is a president who's called black athletes sons of bitches. This is a president who has called black people who come from black and brown countries shitholes. This is a president who has equated neo-Nazis with those who protest against them in Charlottesville. This is a president who has openly violated the very value our country aspires to uphold. Equality under the law, religious liberty, equal protection, and protection from persecution. And to distract from that, he's launching a blatantly racist attack on four duly elected members of the United States of House of Representatives all of whom are women of color. This is the agenda of white nationalists, whether it is happening in chat rooms or it's happening on national TV, and now it's reached the White House garden. He would love nothing more than to divide our country based on race, religion, gender, orientation, or immigration status, because this is the only way he knows he can prevent the solidarity of us working together across all of our differences. The only way to prevent us confronting the problems our country is facing, whether it is health care, climate change, student debt, or our endless wars. This is his plan to pit us against one another. This is how he can continue to enrich his friends and distract us from the detrimental policies that his administration is pushing forth. So we can either continue to enable this president and report on the bile of garbage that comes out of his mouth, or we can hold him accountable to his crimes. We can continue to turn a blind eye of the multiple crimes he's accused of. We can stand while he violates peace people's basic human rights and the responsibility, the responsibility that his administration has for the deaths of children on our border, or we can take action. I have not made impeachment central to my election or my tenure, but since the day that I'd gotten elected, I'd said to people, it is not how, if he will be impeached, but when. So it is time for us to stop allowing this president to make a mockery out of our constitution. It's time for us to impeach this president. So now um, we're going to have um, uh, Alexandria Ocasio, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll try to keep things as brief, I guess, as I can. But who knows when I get on a roll, right? Um, when I was a little girl, my father took me to the reflecting pool here. We were on a road trip from New York to Florida to visit family. 
And I've told this story before, but it was my first time ever with visiting Washington, D.C. And it was my only time visiting Washington, D.C. for years, if not decades. And he rested me on the side of the reflecting pool and had my toes dip in the water. And he had me look at the Washington Monument, he had me look at the Capitol, had me look at the entirety of the capital of our, of our great country. And he looked at everything and he pointed to all of it and he said, this belongs to all of us. This belongs to you and it belongs to me. And so the first note that I want to tell children across this country is that no matter what the president says, this country belongs to you. Mm -hmm. And it belongs to everyone. And today, that notion, that very notion was challenged. This weekend, that very notion was challenged. So I am not surprised when, a, when the president says that four sitting members of Congress should, quote, go back to their own country when he has authorized raids without warrants on thousands of families across this country. I am not surprised that he used, uses the rhetoric that he does when he violates international human rights and takes thousands of children away from their families. I am not surprised that he has turned our public education system under the leadership of Betsy DeVos into a cash cow to enrich himself and his friends. I am not surprised when he corrupts via the Secretary of Transportation. I am not surprised at what he's doing. But I also know that we're focused on making it better because we don't leave the things that we love. And when we love this country, what that means is that we propose the solutions to fix it. We love all people in this country, and that's why we believe health care is a human right. We, we love all children in this country, and because we do, that's why we fight for education for all children through college. And so we'll stay focused on our agenda. And we won't get caught slipping because all of this is a distraction. It's a distraction from what's most important and from our core values as American citizens. And with that, I'll hand it over to Rashida Tlaib. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to my sisters in service. Thank you all so much for being here. As we all know, the recent tweets and words from the president are simply a continuation of his racist and xenophobic playbook. We cannot allow these hateful actions by the president to distract us from the critical work to hold this administration accountable to the inhumane conditions at the border that is separating children from their loved ones and caging them up in illegal, horrific conditions. I represent the third poorest congressional district in this country one that is made of working people who have been targeted by this administration and their actions and words are hurting them today. I was elected to fight for them, fight for the 13th Congressional District. They sent me here to Congress to fight back against the corporate assault and the corruption in our country. This means supporting an impeachment inquiry of this president and his actions by the uh, administration and his appointees. Sadly, this is not the first, nor will it be the last time we hear disgusting, bigoted language from the president. We know this is who he is, and we know that he and his administration are constantly engaged in actions that harm residents and American people in our country. Many members of Congress have called for his impeachment because of his utter disregard and disrespect of the United States Constitution. And despite this and other many attempts to distract us, I remain focused. We remain focused on holding him accountable to the laws of this land and accountable to the American people. I heard, urge House leadership, many of my colleagues, to take action to impeach this lawless president today. And now we'll take two or three questions. Mary, Thank we'll go first. Um, the president today said that many people agree with him and support these comments. I'm wondering if you can speak directly to those supporters of the president and explain why these comments are so harmful and hurtful. And on a personal note, if you can discuss the consequences and impact a bit of these comments. Have you had to up your security? Are you receiving increased threats? Um, I would just say that... Uh, the experience that he offered is in contradiction 
to the experience that I have every day, including in the airport on my way here. There were many people who approached me and who said, I disagree with some of your policies. I'm an independent, I'm a Republican, but I think what he did was wrong. And he won't apologize, but I am going to apologize. So I have um, experienced nothing in the wake of those comments, uh, again, but words of uh, denouncing these xenophobic, bigoted words. But again, this is a distraction and we should not take the bait. We can sit here and continue to recycle his hateful rhetoric, of which I cannot feign surprise, or inflated outrage, because he is, if nothing else, predictable. What we are focused on are the hateful policies that are draconian and oppressive and life-threatening and family-separating that is being rolled out by this administration every day. Um, to, uh, to Omar in particular, but to all of you, can you respond to some of the president's specific claims, most notably that you're a communist and that you're pro-Al-Qaeda? You might have noticed how when he said, go back to where you came from, there was an uproar um, through the... Um, through all of our communities, because every single person who's brown and black at some point in their life in this country heard that. Now, when he made the comment, uh, I know that every single Muslim who has lived in this country and across the world has heard that comment. And so I will not dignify it with an answer because I know that every single Islamophobe, every single person who is hateful, who is uh, driven um, by an ideology of othering, as this president is, uh, rejoices in us responding to that and us defending ourselves. I do not expect every time there is a white supremacist who attacks or there is a, uh, a white man who kills in, uh, in a school or in a movie theater or um, in, uh, uh, in a mosque or in a synagogue, I don't expect my white community members to respond on whether they love that person or not. And so I think it is beyond time, it's beyond time to ask Muslims to condemn terrorists. We are no longer going to allow uh, the dignification of such ridiculous, ridiculous statement. Some of you have made comments that the president took issue with uh, that were controversial. Do you think that some of those comments made, if they were inflammatory, if they were controversial, that this situation would be different? Because he specifically directed some of those same comments back at the court. Can you repeat that? The president took issue with some of the comments that some of you have made on a, on a host of issues and turned them back around at the court. Had those comments not been made, whether they be controversial or not, and you perceive them as being controversial, do you think that that would make this situation different? In other words, he would have the firepower to turn it back around. No. I, I will take this, and I think Alex uh, has, a, has, a, has a great answer for this, so I'll let her finish it. Every single statement that we make is from a place of extreme love for every single person in this country. It is part of the mandate of why we ran for office and why we got elected. Every single person wants to make sure that they have people in the halls of Congress that is fighting to make sure that they have health care, that they have uh, an education that is suitable in the United States, that they have access to proper roads and bridges, that they have access to clean water and clean air. 
Every single person here in the United States knows that we are fighting every single day to create a more perfect union and to fight on their behalf. Now, when people say, if you say a negative thing about the policies in this country, you hate this country. To me, it sort of speaks to the hypocrisy. And Alex and I were talking about this. When this president ran and until today, he talked about everything that was wrong in this country and how he was going to make it great. And so for him to condemn us and to say we are un-American for wanting to work hard to make this country be the country we all deserve to live in, it's complete hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, I, I don't think it would have changed anything because, first of all, he made statements that were blatantly untrue. So whether he was citing comments or not citing comments, if he didn't have what he wanted to say, he would make it up. This president operates in complete bad faith. He does not operate in, in good faith. And so that's one thing. But second, second to, to the previous question as well, um, weak minds and leaders challenge loyalty to our country in order to avoid challenging and debating the policy. This president does not know how to make the argument that Americans do not deserve health care. He does not know how to defend his policies. So what he does is attack us personally. And that is what this is all about. He can't look a child in the face and he can't look all Americans in the face and justify why this country is throwing them in cages. So instead, he tells us that I should go back to the great borough of the Bronx and make it better. And that's what I'm here to do. Thank you all so much for being here. We really do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Hello, YouTubers. If you're watching this, it means you've checked out our channel, so thank you. Now do me a favor. Subscribe by clicking on that button down there. Click on any of the videos to watch the latest interviews and highlights from MTP Daily and MSNBC. You can get more Beat the Press content every morning in the First Read newsletter. If you're tired of content that you don't know anything about where it came from, you don't have to have that problem with us. NBC News, MSNBC, MTP, and the Meet the Press mindset right here for you on YouTube. Subscribe now.